Hi, this is Frank David Green, and welcome to the ITG Listen and Learn Series 2020 COVID Edition. Thank you for joining me. Today's interviewer is my wife, Victoria, who's going to be asking questions that were sent to me and pertaining to this ITG interview. Okay, so Victoria, what's the first question? Question one. What is the best advice you can give to a young lead player? That's the question I probably get most often from people as a lead player. People always want to know how they can do more lead playing or just become a lead player. I think, you know, more than just about, you know, what, what bell you use or what mouthpiece you use or what lead pipe you use or what airstream system or all those types of things, I think maybe I'll touch on the concept of intangibles because I think you're noticing that you're seeing a lot of videos of people playing, lots of guys can play high notes, lots of guys can play real fast and real loud, but then you have to ask yourself, why is it that you always see the same handful of people that do everything if all those people can do that? I think one of the big reasons is because they lack awareness of what I call the intangibles. And one of them, I think a big one is, as far as lead playing goes, well, for many different types of work, but for sure lead playing goes, is understanding who your primary customer is. And so in many cases, I will ask a young person, if you're doing a Broadway show, who your primary customer is. And they'll say, of course, the audience, which of course is not really correct. The primary customer is your conductor, because your conductor is the person that can say yes or no to you being there. And if they say you can't be there, then the audience doesn't get to hear you. The people in the ensemble don't get to see how nice you are, how nice of a person you are, um, how well you play, how consistent you play. They don't get to see any of that because the conductor, that one person, didn't allow you to come back after your first time. And so your primary customer on Broadway, for instance, is the conductor. If you're in a big band, like if I'm playing with Jimmy Heath, Jimmy Heath is my primary customer. So if the audience likes it or doesn't like it, it's not really my biggest concern. My biggest concern is if Mr. Heath likes it. And so if he likes it, we're good because he's my customer. He may have to worry about the club owner who worries about the audience, but my customer is Jimmy Heath. Okay, for our second question, it is what, Victoria? Question two. Mm -hmm. I see that you went to North Texas State University. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason that you chose that school? Oh, big reason. Um, you know, when I'm doing master classes or I'm talking to students about, you know, being successful, one of the things I say to them is you should choose your school based on, if you can, choose your school based on its track record. And so if you want to be a professional football player, you'll go to Ohio State or you'll go to Michigan or you go to Miami because you see the number of people in the NFL that are from those schools. Like if you want to be a lawyer or a politician, you go to Harvard or Yale. For me, the China, music, the China trumpet player, the kind of music I wanted to play, North Texas was an obvious choice. And I think that was a big component of why I was able to move smoothly from college into playing professionally. Okay, so Victoria, what's the next question? Question three. Mm -hmm. You have played with a lot of big bands. Mm -hmm. Which one has the most challenging lead book? Hmm. Challenging. That, well, challenging is a tricky word because they're, for instance, I think maybe the most challenging lead book is playing with the Count Basie Band. I think because the, ba the Basie Band book is sort of steeped in tradition, but you don't really just want to be a robot that plays everything exactly how someone else did it. At the same time, you can't really just completely exert yourself as a lead player. I mean, one of the nice things about playing with so many bands over the years is that people tend to hire me just to play how I play, and that's a really great place to be. You don't have to try to play like someone else. They're not constantly asking you to play in a different way. They're hiring you for how you play. They know how you play and that's what they that's what they want. But in the Basie Band, it's, 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 it is like that, but at the same time, there are certain things that you have to do within the, tr the tradition of that band. And so, because we don't tour all the time, which is great because it means I can do things here in New York, but it means that every time sort of feels like the first time again. So I'd say that's probably the most challenging that way, endurance-wise, and, and, and that maybe Roy, Roy Hargrove's band or maybe playing lead with Maynard Ferguson's band because it was just two trumpets when I did it. I think for just sheer effort, I think maybe Roy's book or, uh, or, the, or Maynard's book were the two hardest for sheer effort and uh, intensity for an extended period of time. Um, other than that, for, you know, maybe Frank Foster for sure. Frank Foster will write really hard music for you. And maybe I'd say that after that might be the playing lead in the Dizzy Gillespie alumni band. Because um, when, when it's John Faddish or Slide Hampton, you never know what they might call that might be challenging to you. So I'd kind of say it kind of falls in that order as far as uh, challenging goes. Before we leave that question, what was Roy's nickname for you? <laughs> <laughs> Roy's nickname for me was Drill Sergeant. I mean, there's a story behind that, but that was Roy's nickname for me. I, I didn't love that name, but... Can you tell us the story? 
of that, of Roy. Oh, well, that's... When I was in the Dizzy Gillespie band years ago, uh, Slide Hampton asked if um, it would be okay if Roy Hargrove came from the front of the band as like the feature performer because Roy wanted to play in the section. And I was really against it. I mean, I love Roy. Anyone who knows me knows how much I love Roy. But I was against it because having a person of, like Roy in the band would either be really great or a huge liability. And I'll be honest, at first it was a huge liability. Um, later it was great. He, but what had happened was we were playing with the Blue Note and I was trying to play my book. And that book's hard enough on my own. But then Roy's music is upside down and inside out and in the wrong place. And so we'd be playing and he'd have to chart up and he'd be... He wouldn't, so I'd have to like remember his part on a pyramid and play my part. And I got really frustrated and so I said to him, I said, okay, so let me get this right. You want me to play my part and your part too as though my part's not hard enough. And so Roy weighed about maybe like 105 pounds <laughs> at that point. And so he turned and kind of stuck his chest up. And I said, what are you going to are you going to try to fight me or something? I said, I outweigh you by about 175 pounds. I said, this is not going to go the way that you think this is going to go. And so he kind of rolled back and and I remember telling the story to my dad, and um, he said, well, what happened after that? I said, well, um, the next day Roy called me up and said, hey, do you want to play lead trumpet in my big band? <laughs> so I think maybe that's a really good piece of advice I should give people is that sometimes the best way to get a gig is to threaten the life of, of your future band leader. <laughs> no, don't, don't ever do that. But that's, that's where the drill started thing came up with Roy. But since then, we've been the best of friends, and Roy became a fantastic section player, maybe one of the best I've ever played with, because yeah. he was a fantastic trumpet player. So that's the story of that. <laughs> okay, Victoria, what's next? Just two more questions. Okay. I saw you play several times on TV on the David Letterman show. Mm -hmm. That lead trumpet chair was a real hot seat. Yeah. I would have been a nervous wreck. Mm. How do you deal with your nerves? Well, you know, it's funny. That's a, mm, that's a tricky question because it's sort of simple to answer, and at the same time, it's a little bit tricky to answer. I think for the David Letterman show, because... You're, you know, the trumpet was the thing that you heard coming in and out of commercial. Was, it was a very dominant sound on that particular show. Um, you kind of had to be, I think, a certain age to feel comfortable because a lot of that music you kind of had to grow up with and you can't really, you couldn't really think about it too much. You kind of have it, kind of had to have it ready in your head. Um, but in general, I think it's really about how you perceive what you're doing. For instance, I wrote a book called The Quiet Mind for Musicians, and the reason I wrote it was for this type of a thing where we were doing a tribute to Maynard Ferguson a few years ago, and the trumpet player sitting next to me was getting very nervous. And um, I saw he was getting nervous. I could tell he, was, he wasn't having a very good time. So I just I leaned over and I said, hey, are you okay? And he said, um, I'm okay. I just feel really nervous. I said, well, let me ask you a question. Does it work for you? Because sometimes being nervous works for people. If it, if it focuses you, then it's good. I said to him, I said, I asked, um, does, does being nervous make you play better or worse? And he goes, well, worse. And I said, well, did you come here to sound bad? And um, he said, no, and then I said, well, then don't get nervous, because if it doesn't work for you, then you're not trying to sound bad. Look, you're going to play how you're going to play. But getting nervous will make you play worse, then why do it? Look, if you're looking for an excuse to sound bad, well, then get nervous. So people can say, yeah, you sounded so bad, and you can say, yeah, I was so nervous. But in reality, you just want to play well. So if, if being nervous helps you to play well, then all, by all means, be as nervous as you want. But for most of us, Finding a way not to be nervous so that we can play well, if we focus on the fact we want to play well, then it makes sense for us to not be nervous. Okay, so Victoria, what's the last question? Question five. Uh, I'm a teacher and I've followed your career over the years. Hmm. What is the single best piece of advice that I can give my students when they ask, how do I get to do this? How do I get to play for a living? Okay, okay. Well, I guess it's like anything else. If you know, since it's about lead trumpet playing, I think if you want to be a lead trumpet player or pretty much anything that you might want to do, I think the biggest thing that you can ask yourself that help to help you eliminate roadblocks and to help you move from one place to the next is to ask yourself this question or to answer this question: Do you even want this? I think knowing if you really even want this is really important. I think sometimes we chase after things without even re knowing or understanding what the thing really might be, and so. A, a, a flute player that I worked with comes to mind. She wanted some help and some coaching. So inevitably I had to ask her, what do you want to do? And, you know, how can I help you? And so she said, I want to play flute in the opera orchestra in New York City. I said, fantastic. So she, I asked her if she knew the principal flautist. And she said, no. Okay. I said, okay. 
and I asked her if she's ever sat in the pit to see what it's even like. Is it, do you even like that working environment? Is this a place that you feel like you want to make music? And she goes, well, I've never sat in the pit before. And so I thought it odd. It's like, you don't even know if you want to do this, but you're saying to me that you want to do this and you're wanting me to help coach you to do something you don't even know if you want to do. So as you can probably imagine, I checked up on her because, you know, that was our last coaching session because I, maybe I didn't say what she wanted to hear. But um, I think last time I checked, she was working at the counter at Macy's, I think in the fragrance counter at Macy's. So, you know, what a shame. I mean, she's probably quite a good flute player from what I understand. And she just because she never asked herself the simple questions, do you even want this? Because if you really want something like this and you know you want it, it's very difficult to stop a person from being successful if they know they want something. It's kind of like a kid when they know they want something. Like, you know, for instance, if a kid wants a bike for Christmas and you don't know they want a bike, you're not paying attention because they're going to tell you about 500 times before Christmas. Hey, mom, I want a bike. Hey, mom, don't forget the bike. I feel like we're a bit like that as people. When we know we want something, we get very focused on it. And I think maybe we draw from childhood. We get very focused on it. It makes it very difficult for us not to get what we want. So I think maybe I'd say that's probably the single best way I could answer this question would be to say, do you even really want this? Do you know what this is and do you want this? So I hope this has been helpful. I want to thank the people at ITG for having me for their Listen and Learn series for the COVID 2020 ITG season. I hope you have a great rest of the year and uh, we can maybe get back to work and get back to playing and doing the things that we love. So thank you and have a great day. Oh, just one more question before you go. Mm -hmm. What mouthpiece do you play? Oh, you know what? I think, here's the thing. I've learned a secret years ago. You have ago. to be quick. Your battery's so, running out.